My name is Mons Kjembe Jensen. I'm from Denmark. I used to be a school teacher. It's many years ago. And I can tell you one thing. If I have to describe myself as, hu as a human being, I am 100% totally without discussion. And I kid you not, crazy. I am absolutely crazy. And a lot of you are nodding. Well, then it makes sense why you're warming up and everything and you have this vibrant energy to you. Um, the thing is, being crazy, every morning I wake up, I tell my, first of all, I say thank you for being the, given the opportunity, but then I said, today it's very important for you, Moons, to be crazy. How many in this room are crazy? Hands up, please. Oh, that's good, that's good. That's very good. I saw actually a few of you doing, uh, you were stricken by something called the SLS syndrome. It's called the shoelace syndrome. Do you remember that in class when a very difficult question that may be a bit challenging is asked and all of a sudden you realize, whoa, my shoelaces just went up, so yeah, fiddle with them and you, after 20 seconds, you resurface and you hope it's all gone away. Today we're going to talk about perception. That actually what we experience in, li in life depends upon the eyes that are viewing what's happening. So crazy, we have about 120 positive spirits in here, I think. If I gave you the task of defining what does it mean to be crazy, maybe I would be given a hundred different definitions, which is fair enough, but since I'm the talker today, of course my version is the true one. <laughs> For me, being crazy is the fact that as a human being, I am totally addicted to tying myself to the things in life that matter the most and give me the biggest why. I try to do the things that are able to ignite a fire within that burns with the power of a thousand volcanoes because then I can ignite what for me is very important and that is the thing that we all need to reach our goals and dreams, passion. Passion as I see it is the bearer of everything because it means that you are doing what makes the most sense for you. Passion brings the biggest why for you. What you can achieve in life depends on how much you can resist. The limit to what we can achieve is what we can resist and thank God for that. Imagine that your biggest dreams came without effort and your biggest mountains in life you could achieve without really having to work hard. I'm 44 years young, that's the biggest surprise so far today because you're all thinking you must be around early 30s just goes to show that being physically fit keeps you young. But the thing is that we have to, you no, know, I can tell you, especially the young people, you're, you're still to realize it, and the people who are my age or a bit older, you will say to yourself, you know, the things that I actually cherished the most were the ones that I had to work the hardest for, because that's where I learned the most. I am an asthmatic. I was diagnosed quite late. I was 26, and it was like a two-edged sword. I was doing triathlon, you know, swimming, running, and biking uh, on a national elite level at the time, training 30 to 40 hours per week, and I often felt tired, which makes sense, right? But I often felt the fact that I was like breathing through a straw, and I went to my doctor after half a year feeling like that, and I did some tests, and he said, well, I can just tell you, you have a big engine from the first test we did, which is fair enough, but as you all know, that's just a, a talent that you have. What is very important is the potential, and potential and talent, if you see, potential is how you utilize your talent. It doesn't matter if you have a big talent and you don't have the will to work hard, because that's 97% of the roads to summiting something like Everest. You only have a 60% exploitation rate of your big engine, he said. So yes, you're an asthmatic. And I, at one point it was a relief, because now I knew that I wasn't just being a chicken. And on the other half, I now had to realize that I had an illness that would probably and most certainly follow me for the rest of my life. Now, this could also be a situation that you're all in. Whenever we're in a situation, we have a choice. I had a choice, I actually had two choices. First of all was, oh, this is, very sad for me and I really have to, oh, I can't do anything about it. 
and I let my illness control me, and I would just sit back in my living room feeling sorry for myself the rest of my life. The wildest activity I would do, and no hard feelings, but playing bridge. Getting a comfort zone this small. That's choice A. Choice B is no way. I will not let myself be limited. I will take control of my illness, and then I will learn what it takes for me to be able to live a normal life and to be able to dream just as high as before I was given this diagnosis. Now, whenever you do th things, there are two ways of motivation. The first one is internal motivation. What can ignite the fire within? What's in it for me? What's my big why? And the second one is what messages do I want to send to the world around me? Well, I have climbed the highest mountain on Earth, as you see here, Mount Everest, almost 9,000 meters high, the cruising altitude of an a Airbus 380, if I were the only person in the world? Well, it, it's a trick question. Of course I wouldn't. There was also another message that I could send. I wanted to send other messages. First of all, I thought, if you're an asthmatic, you do know that uh, you, you can be rather challenged breathing. If an asthmatic can go to the place on Earth where there's the least amount of oxygen available, one third as compared to here, that would be the biggest metaphor, in my opinion, that I could send to myself, that anything is possible even though you're asthmatic. And also, if we look at the external motivation, if I can do this and have that serve as the platform for be the change you want to see in the world that Gandhi said many years ago. The fact that one person actually has a chance of starting with himself if he wishes to see a difference and maybe affecting other asthmatics that they shouldn't let themselves be limited. An asthmatic with such thin arms as me on the summit of Everest. Then an asthmatic in Canada could be looking at that and saying, wow, if that's possible for him, then I can pursue my own Everest here in Canada. I've always dreamed about running four kilometers around my lake, but I've never done it. I'm 25 years old. It's been a 15-year-old dream. But because him or her hears that, hears that story, they said, if he can do that, I pursue my own Everest. And then they start. And do you know the best way to climb a mountain? Anybody has a good, an idea? Then please raise your hand. What's the best way to climb a mountain? You're absolutely right. It's taking one step at a time. Now, I'm a curious person and I'm a wandering person. So I thought climbing Everest in itself wasn't enough. And I know I'm crazy. How could I make the challenge bigger? Well, when I decided to climb Everest, about 4,000 people had done it less than 80 people had done it without supplemental oxygen. So I thought, how many of the 80 had asthma? How many do you think had asthma at the time who had done it without those? It was a big fat zero. So why not create world history and become the first asthmatic in the world to summit Everest without oxygen? Now, if we have a, a challenge scale from 1 to 10, where would you say that we are right now? An asthmatic school teacher wanting to climb Everest without oxygen, is that a 5 in your rate? Yeah, you're nodding. That's, it's a good thing to see you have, like here, a lot of dimensions for the end result. But it wasn't 10 for me, so I thought, I'm going to increase the challenge. And having a small brain, I was running out of options, you know. So I had to think for a long time. But then in the end, I realized, I now have my ultimate challenge for myself before I become a father. So my ultimate challenge was, instead of flying from Denmark to Nepal, I could transport myself. So in the end, my 10 became cycling and running 11,500 kilometers from Denmark through 13 countries down to Everest Base Camp in Tibet, as you see here, as a warm-up to climbing Everest without oxygen as the first asthmatic in the world. And yes, you can continue running. You're absolutely right, Mons. There are a lot of ways to define being crazy, and you have just given us a few. Fair enough. But that was what I thought I was capable of. And doing that, one thing, because you all are going to pursue your own Everest, you have to remember one thing, that when you do that, you also invite the possibility of failure. And that is one thing you have to be aware of. I have one of my mantras is, if you fall seven times, there's only one thing for you to do, and that is stand up eight. The limit to what you can achieve is going to be what you can resist, and that means that you may fail twice, 
I summited Everest not in my first attempt. I cycled and ran all the way down to base camp. I reached 8,500 uh, meters and I had to turn around because it was too cold. I was losing my foot. Imagine being done with 99.99% .99 of your journey and you can write world history and you have to turn around. Then it's very important to have a big why when you come back home that says, am I going to find the motivation to train for another year and come back? My big why was big enough, so I did that. On my third attempt, I summited Everest. So that just goes to show that you have to have so much passion, you have to have so much realization that just because you don't succeed in your first or second attempt, no one said that the third attempt wouldn't be the lucky chance where it happened. So that's actually something that can be done if you just continue working hard. It's the same thing here, I heard a great story that this school started with five students and today I think the number was 1500. That to me is an, a journey of climbing an Everest in itself. Maybe some of you look at that, that's fair enough. I just told you what I did and you think that, that's impossible. Well, it was for me in the beginning, but I was able to know that I had to take one step at a time. It's the same with you have a big cake, you only eat one piece at a time and then it can be done. One thing if you imagine you have a mountain, one side is the dream and the goal and the other side, what happens to a mountain that only has one side? It collapses like this and then you have a straight line. Did anyone ever go to a hospital? If you have an EKG done, the nurse will tell you moans when you have your EKG, it's a good thing it goes like this. If you have a straight line, you have a problem, so you have to pull the, the red string, right? Because then you're dead. So you have to realize that life is about the sinus curve. And up here is great, but it takes a lot of effort to go uphill. So here you have the dream before venturing. And the next one, you have the price that I had to pay. I had to go to the absolute limit of human capacity, physically and mentally. I had to go to a place where I didn't care whether I lived or died. That was the price I had to pay to fulfill my dream. And I don't know if you recognize the next person on the picture, but I think I look a bit older. Yeah? And that's the price I had to pay. And I willingly did it. I've just come down from the summit of Everest here, and I really don't care much whether I live or die. I'm that tired. There's only a little fire within the eyes that says moons. You're only halfway on the summit of Everest. If you sit down and die, you won't be able to go home and tell all your stories. So when you summit a mountain, remember, you're only halfway and 90% of all accidents happen on the way down. One thing I've learned is that it doesn't matter whether you believe that your dream can come true or not, then you're right. Because it's a matter of perception. The human brain what do you think it has the easiest task of doing? Negative thinking or positive thinking? Negative thinking because the human brain finished its development during Stone Age and if you were positive during Stone Age, you would get killed because a tiger would be eating you. So that's the mechanism we still have. It takes an active awareness to be positive. And we know that positive mindset is good for us. It broadens our horizons. It makes our well-being better. But the thing is, remember that, it doesn't matter if you think you can do it or not, you're right because your focus becomes your reality. So remember that. And here you have another focus. I don't, I don't know if you can imagine what that one would feel like. You're under pressure, you have something like, that's in Turkey, it's not on Everest, it was just on going the way down, I had to cycle. Or eight days in minus 30 degrees and that meant after 10 minutes on my mountain bike, I was like this. <laughs> after half an hour, I couldn't feel my fingers and my hands. I had to go in and warm up in the car. Can you understand that I had a little devil in the back of my head who said, what on earth are you doing here? Let's turn around and go back home. And the only answer that I could find to make us go forwards was to look in my mental backpack and find my why. Why am I doing this? If you can't find a why big enough, when you meet a mountain before your big mountain, then you're going to turn around. So what I did was saw, I saw everything on the way as a preparing task that would maybe give me 1% extra for tomorrow. 1% can be the difference between success and failure. So 
I just continued and I broke it into small pieces, one step at a time. And then you also have to remember that Gandhi also said that the journey is the goal. Focus on the journey and pick up all the small parts of positivity. You have had a hard day cycling or working hard, but if you have a sunset like that, cherish it and feel grateful and then all the pain will go away. So remember to enjoy the good things. What it actually meant, I started on the front page of my local newspaper. It was a middle-sized town of Denmark, which is 40,000. That's a big uh, city in Denmark, 40,000 inhabitants. We only have 5 million people living in Denmark, so you understand. But the thing is, I didn't sum it on my first attempt, but on the second and third attempt, chance would, or fate, or maybe the, the Lord in the sky, that Discovery Channel, it's a, it's a small American documentary channel, right? You, you're, this uh, gentleman is from America. He'll know that Discovery Channel is huge. But apparently, the fact was that Discovery Channel had made a deal with my expedition organizer to do a global documentary. 12 programs, 45 minutes sent globally. So all of a sudden, instead of having a platform of my own time, I became one of the main characters on Discovery Channel. I was the first Dane ever to be on the, a global Discovery Channel program. So instead of having 40,000 people as a platform to get my message out, as we speak today, 10 years after the, the programs came out first, more than half a billion people have watched the programs. And because I was one of the main characters, I have had the big blessing of being able to inspire people. So every week, for 10 years, I've had emails from people around the world who have seen the programs and said, Mons, that was very inspiring. I am an asthmatic, and I've used your story to see the fact that I don't have to limit myself. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that the biggest compliment you can get as a human being is the fact that you can inspire other people and help other people. There's a saying that I think is very much important. We are living in an age where self-realization has been a big topic. But the best thing you can do for yourself if you're having a bad day, go help someone. Thank you.